Now that I'm used to the climate A thing that if man ever found A place to live easy and happy That Eden is on Puget Sound Eden is on Puget Sound That Eden is on Puget Sound A place to live easy and happy that Eden is on Puget Sound. Hello, you are listening to The Seattle Files. My name is Chris Allen. I'm your host. Every week I get together with a different local comedian, and together we discuss the strange, unusual, interesting, and oftentimes lesser-known aspects of our local history. Joining me today the program is Brett Hamill. How's it going, Brett? Hey, it's going good. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Brett is a stand-up comedian around town. He is also the creator and host of the show The Seattle Process, uh, which goes up at Northwest Film Forum. They'll be doing a live show at Bumbershoot this year. Uh, we're going to be on the same uh, Bumbershoot stage, not the same time, but uh, we're both performing in the Words and Ideas stage. you want to tell us about The Seattle Process? The uh, Seattle Process is a political comedy talk show. I usually have uh, local politicians, activists, and artists on the show. We do sort of jokey segments, and it's funny, but we also talk about real stuff as well. And, uh, yeah, it happens It's happens quarterly at the Northwest Film Forum when we're not doing Bumbershoot. Cool. So, so it's, a, it's a show about the Seattle present, the Seattle of today. Yes, uh, about the politics. I mean, I guess the theme of the show is, um, you know, trying to save the soul of this city and figure out how the actual process works, how they knife a good idea to death over there in, in city council. Mm, so, cool. Interesting. Uh, how long have you lived in the Seattle area? I've been here since 2000, summer of 2000. Well, where'd you come from? I came from Florida. Okay. What brought what brought you out here? Uh, the standard uh, undergrad buddy moved out here. I visited and loved it and and was sold. Cool. And came out and uh, still love it. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. So you know a lot about what's going on in Seattle today. How much do you know about local history? Um, woefully little, although I love history. I love weird stories and arcana and such, but I don't, I never like did a sort of systematic review of Seattle history. Okay. So I bet stuff comes up when you're researching and learning about the Seattle process. Definitely. Um, or just also like when I go on the road, um, I try to learn about the towns in Washington state that I'm visiting mm-hmm. and such. Um, so yeah, it comes up a bit. Cool. And you have no idea what we're going to be talking about today, correct? Nope. Awesome. Let's get started. Uh, Henry Leder Yesler was born sometime around 1810 in Leadersburg, Maryland. There is a question of whether or not his parents were married at the time of his birth, which haunted his later life. An eventual suit over his father's estate raised the question of if he was born in 1810, 1812, or 1813, and is likely it will never be known for sure. Oh, the 19th century. Yeah, or nobody's really sure what year it is. It's always, it's the best when the person themselves doesn't know because mm-hmm. uh, they weren't really, you know, yeah, uh, they don't have cognizant a great... at the time. So yeah. just how weird that's got to be to just just not know exactly when you were born. Yeah, it's, not it's like you probably are. a bit of a relief too. Yeah, like it's you can free. Just fudge your age every year. Yeah, I never thought about just it like a that. Dealer's choice. Uh, his parents were married for a short time before divorcing and marrying others. Uh, he would be estranged from his father for the rest of his life. Yesler was an apprentice to a carpenter at 17, and in 1832 moved to Maslin, Ohio. He worked as a carpenter for a year before moving down to New Orleans, up to New York, and in several other places before returning to Ohio. Traveling around the country. Rambling man with daddy issues. Mm, Yeah, pretty much. Back in Maslin, he met and married Sarah Berger in 1839. The two had a daughter who died in infancy and a son, George. Yesler built and operated two water-powered mills in Ohio. He was successful in doing well, but thought that if he headed out west to where there was untouched miles of virgin forest, he could make a real fortune in lumber. I feel like this, so far, this whole scenario is taking place in the same narrative universe as There Will Be Blood. Uh, Oh, yeah. uh, The one guy's digging oil wells. This guy's doing paddle wheels. Like he's, you know, it's, uh, yeah, very true to the times. And they're both heading out west to try to uh, find their fortune and and scam people hard. Yeah. Wild frontier. Yeah. Pretty much. And and just grab, grab a hold of the industry and take it out. Take it out of the frontier. The the, the elemental things of earth, oil and wind and water wheels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) 
Uh, the California Gold Rush in 1849 sent him west. He left his wife and son in Ohio and sailed down to Panama, crossed the Isthmus, and headed north to San Francisco. Very common method of getting out here, because you don't want to cross the Oregon Trail, because it's very dangerous. Uh, he spent some time scouting in California and decided that it wasn't the best place to build a mill. He went nor- north to Portland and decided that that, wasn't suit- uh, that that was unsuitable as well. Hmm. Looking for a place to build a mill. He contacted his financial backer in Ohio, John McLean, not that John McLean, <laughs> but different John McLean, and requested he acquire and ship him the equipment for a steam-powered mill to be delivered around South America to San Francisco, where he could collect it and set it up when the proper location was found. So front me a mill. Yeah. The it, logistics are just insane on these transactions. Trying to get across to the other side of the country when there's no transcontinental railroad, there's no Panama Canal. No Amazon Prime. Yeah. No drones delivering packages over <laughs> us. Uh, it was in San Francisco that this, uh, sea, he met a sea captain who told him about a small piece of water on the Puget Sound called Elliott Bay. The trees went nearly up to the water. The bay was deep enough to harbor large ships. So Yesler took a ship from Portland to Olympia and then paddled a canoe up to Elliott Bay. <laughs> On October 20th, 1852, he was greeted by settlers on what is now called Alki Point. The settlers were calling it New York Alki. Uh, the ta- yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't like that name? Yeah, I no. just hate the, like, we moved from this, you know, persecution or whatever on the East Coast. Let's name our town the same name. Yeah, like, it's just- let's name it New York. Uh, the Terry brothers, who were part of the Denny party, uh, decided they wanted to build the next New York and named it thusly. Alki was a Lachutzi word that meant by and by or in a little while. Um, so they were kind of making fun of the settlers, and they combined it to make New York Alki. It was pronounced Alki back in the day, hmm. but now it's been kind of anglicized to Alki. So this is basically just um, this is just street name bingo right now. Uh, essentially, yes, yeah. Denny, Terry, yeah. You know, we're working our way up Capitol Hill. That was an alternate name to this podcast. Was so that's why the streets are named that, <laughs> or Chris Allen mansplains history. But, uh, yeah, but these are all. I mean, they're all these settlers came out in 1851, and that's they they named everything essentially after George Vancouver came and named everything beforehand. Mm-hmm. So uh, he gets here, and the group of settlers that inhabited Seattle had been drawn out west by the prospect of free land. Uh, the Donation Land Claim Act of 1850 said that any white man could claim 320 acres of land free in the Oregon Territory, and any married couple 640 acres of land, which is a square mile. So we're still we're in the Oregon Territory at this point. Wow, it's Oregon, Washington, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. So are basically, you get an extra, you get to double your land just by having a wife. Just by having a wife, yeah. Single man get 320, married couples get 640, single women get nothing. Hmm. The Denny Party had set themselves up there less than a year earlier, and while some remained on the point, Alki Point, others had moved to the other side of Elliott Bay, where downtown Seattle is now. Yesler didn't like Alki as the site of the mill, but was drawn to the other side of the bay. There was a small spit of land jutting out that had deep water on each side, ideal for building a mill, which a pier could come out of and load lumber onto ships. The land was owned by Carson Boren and Doc Maynard. So another check on your bingo there. Uh, Boren had been the first of the Denny Party to come to the other side of the bay and built the first building in Seattle proper on what is now the corner of 2nd and Cherry. Just read it from where Cherry Street Coffee is. Yeah, you had to really screw up back then. If you were like a white guy of industry, you had to really screw up to not get a street named after you, I think. If you were one of these like, people? Yeah. Uh, the, the, there's a, a little statue and a little memorial out on Alki Point commemorating where the Denny party first landed. And it, it's, it's been amended, but the, the original plaque that's still up there says Arthur Denny and wife, David Denny and wife, Carson Boren and wife. It's just, oh, really, wow. really 1850s people. They survived <laughs> crossing the Oregon Trail. It's, uh, bracing. Yeah. <laughs> to consider. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, now they all have street names after them. Except for, except for the women that crossed. So Maynard had arrived shortly after the Denny party. He came from Cleveland by way of Olympia. The two had been working hard, uh, Maynard and Bourne had been working hard cleaning out the waterfront, clearing out the land on the waterfront, clearing out the trees. And Maynard had been employing natives to salt salmon that he could sell at his small goods store, the Seattle Exchange. Yesler offered the proposition of building the sawmill on the spit if they would agree to part with the land. They declined the offer, saying they didn't want to give up a choice piece of property they had already spent so much time clearing. Yesler thanked them and went back to his canoe to take another look at Alki Point. 
Maynard and Boren spoke with, spoke with each other about the prospect of letting the stranger have a piece of property that straddled both their land claims. Because a mill would mean jobs, and it would mean money, and it could turn the small community into a more powerful and prosperous one. So the two had a change of heart, caught up with Yesler, and told him that they could have the land, and they adjusted their land claims. So they hadn't, they'd, they'd staked their claims, but they hadn't filed their claims yet. So they each shifted their claims. And Yesler took his own claim, and Yesler was married, his wife was still back in Ohio, so he took 640 acres in kind of a, an umbrella shape that goes up what's now Yesler Way, and then kind of expands out into First Hill and Capitol Hill, hmm. and the Central District is all that, that was all his land. Jeez. So you've got Maynard in what's now the International District, Carson Boren in what's kind of downtown Seattle, and then this this uh, uh, this spit, this jut of land that comes up from the water where Yesler Way is, and then umbrellas out First Good Hill and Lord. Capitol Hill. Just just wide swaths of the city. Yeah, yeah, just huge amounts of what's now billions of dollars worth of property yes, w- without with just from filing a claim. Yeah, and. You know, borrow. You know, building a mill. Like if you were, like, had at all a work ethic and you know some skills, you'd have to really be a lunkhead to not make it. Right. Or, yeah. You know, you got typhoid or something. Right. You died of dysentery crossing the Oregon Trail. Yes. But people that made it out here, they they prospered very well. A lot of these families still in Seattle too. Mm-hmm. Um, the there's the Mercers are still in Seattle. They the, Queen Anne was their land claim. Thomas Mercer's land claim is Lower Queen Anne. Uh, Mercer Street is the southern border of his land mm-hmm. claim. Uh, the the Borens are still here. The Denny's are still here. So a lot of these families are still here, and and I believe they're pretty affluent now. <laughs> you think? I believe so. Uh, so an Olympia newspaper reported, quote, We have heretofore neglected to notice the fact that there is a new steam mill in process of erection by Mr. H. L. Yesler at Seattle, mouth of the Duwamish River, and which we are told will be ready to go into operation early in November, and no mistake. Huzzah for Seattle. It would be folly to suppose that the mill would not prove as good as a gold mine to miss Mr. Yesler, besides tending greatly to improve the fine town site of Seattle and the fertile country around it, by attracting thither the farmer, the laborer, and the cow. Capitalist. On with improvement. <laughs> I love the prose style of these old newspapers. <laughs> they're great. It's, they're, they're a fair bit boosterish, don't you think? Uh, yeah. How right. could he not fail? Like, what, what are you? What are they buying ads in this this broadsheet? Like, come yeah. on, tone it down a little, newspaper guy. I'm picturing a guy with suspenders standing on a soapbox, yelling through a cone <laughs> on a street corner. A uh, small, also s- slow news day for sure. Yeah, like, right. Like, no Indian raiding parties or, mm. you know, dysentery outbreaks. Let's go with the, hey, where, didn't you say something about a mill? Let's just mm. go ahead and run with that story. We need 500 words on the mill. <laughs> uh, I, I can come up with 10. Yeah, come up with well, 500 words on the mill. Pat it out by painting a picture <laughs> yeah, of exactly. the, the farm man, the, the, the laborer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the small spit of land where he intended to build, the, to build his mill was an island at very high tides. The whole of the waterfront had been called the Little Crossing Over Place by natives for centuries. Uh, Yesler left Elliott Bay to go down to San Francisco and wait for his gear to arrive. The five men who lived in Seattle and their families, so only five people are living in, what, five men and their families are living in downtown, what's now downtown Seattle, uh, built a makeshift wooded structure to house the equipment when it arrived. Yesler also built a log cookhouse, which became the center of all municipal activity for years. Mill workers would take their meals there, but it was also the site of Seattle's first sermon, first election, and first trial. The mill equipment left New York in May of 1852, but was delayed and didn't reach Seattle until early 1853. Getting the equipment on shore was a mess. Yesler would later say, quote, We had to throw it on the, all in the water and let it float ashore. The boiler was floated in this way, but the engine was placed on a raft. There was a 12-horsepower engine, a boiler, a 48-inch circular saw, and all the connecting gear. The mill was quickly assembled and cut its first, first tree March 1853. So just about two years of him saying, I can build you a mill. The mill is all set up and ready to go. Real go-getter. Mm-hmm. You know, you just, I mean, you have to consider that uh, these guys obviously stole all the land. Yeah. They, the title to it, you know, doesn't, you know, this belongs to the Duwamish. And mm-hmm. it's, it's hard to, it's hard to enjoy history and, to, and consider just the theft the of, of yeah. the native cultures. But at the same time, I'm really jealous. You know, I would love to live in a area where I had like five neighbors, you know, 
with that like much a space, square mile or so, and with thousands of miles, whatever between. I wanted with my property, and there was no zoning laws or uh, so. It's it's mixed mixed emotions. Mixed here. life expectancy is also about forty nine at this point. Um, I mean, infant mortality rate was high, and that affects it. But people did not certainly did not live as long, mm-hmm. and it was it was a tough life. I'm, I mean, yes, they did steal a lot of the land from from the natives, and there were uh, if you were a straight white cisgendered man, then things could be pretty good for you. Yeah, but everybody else, not so much. Pretty crappy. Mm-hmm. Do you have any sense of what they used to eat back then? Like you know, here in Seattle. Well, there was a saying among the natives that if you were hungry, just wait for low tide. So they ate a lot of seafood, a lot of seafood, okay. uh, and then they would have hunted deer, and they would have gotten meat that way. A lot of salmon. Hmm. So, yeah, just just wild, wild berries, all kinds of stuff. Lots of berries. Mm-hmm. It's berry season now. Oh, yeah. Uh, Yesler constructed a wooden aqueduct to bring fresh water from the hills down to, the power, uh, down to power the mill. It was Seattle's first water system and was soon extended to supply ships with fresh water. Yesler would say, later in 1878... Quote, my mill was the first steam mill put up on the Puget Sound. Lumber sold for $35 a thousand then, now, in 1878, for $10. And there was no wharf the lumber had to be rafted from the mill to the vessels. After the establishment of the mill, which was commenced in 52, the town grew rapidly. We commenced sawing wood under a shed in March 53. The sawdust we filled swamps with and the slabs we built a wharf with. And that was another big thing. These, uh, there's all this marshy land. So they, there's a guy named Dutch Ned who takes all the sawdust and he starts filling in the potholes in the marshland with sawdust. So it's soupy and the, the land is really just, just mm. messy. Dutch or, Ned, like, didn't have too many job skills, let's be honest. <laughs> just, Dutch Ned was very <laughs> ambitious in saying we can fill in these, we can fill in this marshland with sawdust. Uh, and they used to say if you're going down to the south side of town, you were going down on the sawdust. That's where all the brothels and stuff mm-hmm. were, down where Skid Road was. Say, so going down on the sawdust. That going, you're going down on the sawdust to, to get yourself a lady <laughs> for the night. The wharf would grow to extend a thousand feet into Elliott Bay. The mill operated 24 hours a day. Men would work in 12 hour shifts, shifts and ship, ship, and shipped lumber as far as Australia. Yesler hired on whites as well as natives, and nearly all the men in Seattle worked for him at one time or another. He had a reputation of being fair with the natives. And everything you'll read about Yesler, you'll, you'll, you'll find that he said that he was very gracious and very accepting of the natives. That's good but to hear. Very big of him, considering he took a, mile, <laughs> yeah. a square mile of their land. He, he took their land, and then they got to work for in, him in a oh, mill. Oh, God, yeah. Um, I used to work in a wood shop all the way oh, through really? college. And, and, you know, I used to stand behind these giant boring machines and just with plumes of sawdust dousing me. And it's not uh, – it's dirty work. It's not especially, glamorous. Especially when you're actually milling raw lumber. There's the sap and the resin and mm. – you know, it's a sticky, nasty job. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's wow. But here, you know, well, this isn't our land anymore. But we can. But you can make you can make money. A couple pennies a day. Yeah. For, yeah. Make a little bit of money. Yesler's wife and son were still in Ohio, and they didn't know where he was. Sarah Yesler would write and send letters to cities up and down the West Coast, hoping that one might find her husband. In 1855, Yesler had a daughter with a teenage Duwamish girl. Yesler was in his 40s, and the girl was a daughter of one of his employees, and the two were living together as well. Less sympathetic okay. than a year at this point, for okay. sure. And he's he's just gone AWOL from his wife. Like, you couldn't drop a line, man? Like, well, you know, that's, yeah, he said, I'm, I mean, I'm if I don't answer west. my wife's text in, like, 10 minutes, she's <laughs> like, where are you? I get, like, a follow-up text. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, wow. So he, People were, you know... I mean, it wouldn't have been uncommon for not them for not to get any correspondence for weeks or even months at a time. But this has been years at this point, and she has no idea who he is. But he's still talking to John McLean, his business partner. So. <laughs> maybe she should t- maybe she should give talk John to John. A holler. <laughs> Seems like he knows what's up. Yeah, uh, Yesler sold a large tract of land to his employee William Gross. Uh, William Gross was the second African American citizen of Seattle. Gross was a Navy veteran who, and had worked with helping slaves escape as a part of the Underground Railroad. So Gross is a badass. He comes out here, he buys a big tract of land from Yesler, and today that land is known as the Central District, which is wow. still an African American neighborhood. Yeah, well, for now. For now, it's getting gentrified. But what a lot a of badass, though. Yeah, yeah, Gross is awesome. 
Underground uh, Railroad, and then makes it all the way out here. Mm-hmm. And it's just and this well this and this would still be are we still before pre Civil War? This is pre Civil War. Yeah, okay. this is eighteen fifty five. Wow. So yeah, it it's speaks uh, to their. Um, uh, I wouldn't say at least their tolerance that they would uh, hire on a black man mm-hmm. in, the, in that time. Yeah. I mean, most of the people that, that were moving out here were Republican. They were Northerners. And one of the big things with the Donation Land Claim Act was they were trying to get people to move out here in order to get political power for the North. Yes. Because right, the Mexican-American War, war ended in 1848, and uh, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, all of that land became a part of the U.S., it was part of Mexico before, and that's all below the line that says it's okay to have slaves. So there was this fear that the southern expansion was going to create a great deal of political power in Washington, D.C., more Senate seats, more congressional seats, and kind of tip power towards the slave owners, slave owning states. So that's one of the big things with the Nation Land Claim Act. They're trying to get people to move out here, uh, Republicans to move out here, because the Republicans were typically anti-slave Democrats were pro-slave back then. So a lot of people that are moving out here are abolitionists in the first place. Uh, Mercer was an abolitionist, and he and Daniel Bagley, his partner, came out here uh, for that very reason. Uh, the Battle of Seattle was in 1856. Uh, the conflict came about over anger caused by a series of treaties where natives were forced to sign over their land in exchange for protection on small reservations. Yesler was able to receive information about some plans of attack, warn the settlers, and convince some natives to avoid involvement. After the battle was over, two settlers were dead, somewhere between 200 to 500 natives were dead, and the town was in ruins. And Yesler donated large amounts of wood to help rebuild the city. It's in 1856. <sighs> 200 to 500. We, they Not don't know. a very accurate count. Well, but, they didn't oh, find wow. any bodies. All the bodies were oh, dragged were away. away. Yeah, so they, they don't know, but that's the estimate between 200 and 500. Good Lord. That, yeah. I mean, that must have been a huge, you know, chunk of the popu- local population at the time. Yeah. Just, like, well, the uh, Chief Seattle and a lot of the Duwamish and Suquamish, he took out to uh, Alki Point, where where mm-hmm. they'd be like, "We need to get out of here, so we'll get out here and we'll be safe." And uh, other tribes and other there's is it, the after the signing of a lot of the treaties, especially the Point Elliot Treaty, which ceded basically the entire Puget Sound basin and said the natives had to go live on reservations. There was uh, about two or three years of conflicts and wars called the Treaty Wars. Mm. Uh, and by 1857, there were several other mills on the Puget Sound that brought competition to Yesler and drove the price of lumber down. Sarah Yesler, back in Ohio, uh, had gotten in contact with Henry and persuaded him to try to sell, persuade him to sell everything and come back home, but he refused and sent for her to join him. Um, in 1858, he built a large manor on the corner of First Avenue and James Street and sent Sarah the money to make the trip out west, but their son George remained in Ohio. With his wife coming, he sent his live-in teenage girlfriend and their child to live with Jeremiah Benson, another settler in the area. The two would remain there for years and be lifted as a member of the Benson family until eventually Yesler's daughter, Julia, would return to the Yesler household to work as a servant. Yesler's Yesler's kind of an asshole. into some biblical shit. Yeah. Yeah, wow. he's he, he's got a few redeeming qualities, but he's kind of a terrible more, person. Yeah, more of a you know saw running guy than a emotional uh, yeah. savant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not the most uh, empathetic person <laughs> yeah. in the world. I, I just the the gall of like, yeah, you know, he finally dropped her a line, and she's like, and then that must have been a fun exchange. Like, hey, just sell it all and come back, you jerk. Like, yeah. Like, no, I'm actually not going to do that. Um, but why don't you come live with me? I'll send here. my teenage girlfriend away so <laughs> yeah. we can be together again. You're going to love it here. <laughs> like, <sighs> yeah. You know, one, in between, like, skirmishes with the natives, uh, it's great. <laughs> Uh, back in Ohio, their son George died within a year of Sarah leaving of an unidentified viral disease. So now they have two kids that have died. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a mess in the family. Sarah and Henry Yesler had unconventional beliefs about life and marriage for their time. Sarah thought nothing of Henry's infidelity, and she herself had a long-lasting affair with her friend Eliza Hurd. The two were openly polyamorous and advocates of free love and open relationships. There is a long-standing theory that Yesler is the illegitimate father of writer Jack London. 
London's mother lived with Yesler for a time, and she was also from Maslin, Ohio. She moved to San Francisco about a year before Jack was born. The man who is usually understood to be London's father was also a free uh, free thinker and gave lectures on the benefits of open relationships, and he claims to have been impotent. What a strange time in, in history when when they were talking about something that is still considered revolutionary and, and kind of out there, like yeah. polyamory and free love and stuff. Um, of course, they did it in their, like, sort of Victorian way, I'm sure. Yeah. It's like, Please disrobe. Like, a, you know, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't uh, like They weren't smoking hash. Right there, and, uh, like, yeah, but, laying on beanbag chairs. But it's still, chairs. you know, it, it makes you... I like those moments where you can see that uh, people still... Uh, there were free thinkers, that they weren't strictly bound by, like, the grim realities of survival. You mm-hmm. know? That stuff's neat. Yeah, especially in the uh, in the late 1800s, there's a lot of just weird experimentation stuff, and people are like, think think Berkeley in the 1960s, and that's kind of what a lot of people are doing in the 1890s. They're really trying to reevaluate and rethink what's going on and what society is about. And, and, and so you it, know that if that if this made it into the historical record, I mean, they were screwing like crazy. Because, <laughs> yeah, like, that's true. I mean, it wasn't some like. Do we know how that? We know how that what, information got to us. We or? know about Sarah Yesler's uh, lesbian relationship with Eliza Hurd through their private correspondences. That was found later. Uh, but but Henry Yesler was pretty open. It was it was just known around town that that that's what went on at the Yesler place. That it, the uh, let's see here, uh, Dan, the Reverend Daniel Bagley ref, Daniel Bagley referred to them as God forsaken people in his sermons. <laughs> All those planks weren't the only wood he was sporting. <laughs> uh, after the death of their son, the Yeslers also became increasingly fascinated with spiritualism. They welcomed spiritualist and astrologer W. Lee Cheney into their home, and they regularly held seances. And that's another big thing around the, the turn of the century is spiritualism and seances and communing with the dead. They were These guys were the sort of... The modern equivalent would be like a poly burning man... Um, holistic, but uh, uh, tech tech people. I but would, also yeah, because they're because yeah, they're wealthy are, and they're they're sure. people of industry. So they I would, would say Microsoft Burning Man people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or like the Amazon programmer that makes you know two hundred thousand dollars a year, but then drops acid and you know has mm-hmm. has an open relationship with his wife. Yeah, that's hmm. that's pretty much who the Yeslers are. The Yeslers had an open-door policy and let into their home many men and women who were down on their luck and had nowhere else to go. In the late 1850s, Yesler developed many properties on his land, a Yesler Pavilion, a general store, a theater, and a community meeting hall. The road leading down to the sawmill was named Mill Street, and loggers and mill workers would slide or skid logs down the road to be processed in the mill, and that gave it the nickname Skid Road. Uh, Skid Road is a much older logging term, but in Seattle it became the first time it was referred to as a neighborhood, and then many other cities later adopted that term. So you've got Skid Road. A row refers to a string of brothels, so that's how Skid Road became Skid Row. Mm. And now cities all over the world have a Skid Row. Uh, in 1860, or excuse me, oh yeah, in 1865, along with settler Charlie Terry, he started the Seattle Water Company, which would use hollowed out logs to divert spring water throughout the city. An interesting tidbit. Seattle water still, some of it still comes through wooden water pipes. That's we, wild. We still have some wooden water pipes and some wooden sewer pipes that divert our water through. So sort of a, it's sort of an almost Flintstone-like uh, set yeah. that they've got going They're on. They're hollowed out logs, and then they have uh, little wooden connectors to uh, to put them together. But it, when the wood gets wet, it expands, and as long as it stays wet, it'll stay airtight. But probably not for 150 years. Just a, a Gilligan's Island style uh, yeah. product. Yeah, essentially it's just a makeshift uh, solution that worked really well, and so it's still to this day. By the late 1860s, Yetler, Yesler had stretched himself thin. Uh, he had diversified his business interests, but was not turning a profit. He had made great improvements on the mill, but the cost of updating, the cost of updating equipment was expensive. He had interest in water and coal, but financially wasn't doing well. He tried to sell the mill and waterfront property for $65,000, but was unsuccessful. In 1875, he was elected to a one-year term as mayor, uh, but was still in financial hardship. So seventh mayor of Seattle. How do you run all that? How do you run all that industry and not 
turn a profit. It just well, the other mills are popping up, and it's driving down the cost of lumber. Mm-hmm. So it's like what he said before that it was thirty five dollars for a thousand, and now it's ten dollars for a thousand by eighteen seventy eight. So the price of his commodity is dropping. So he's he's not making nearly as much money as he was, but he's still employing people, and he still has to pay them the same rate he hired them on as. So he's his profits are just sinking down. So he's trying to sell it for $65,000, not able to do that. He designed, uh, devised a plan to raise funds by holding a lottery. Uh, the prizes would be the sawmill and his assets. He's going to have a lottery, give away the sawmill's first prize. The problem was lotteries were illegal in the Washington Territory. He went to the territorial legislation and persuaded them to allow him to go forth with the lottery, provided that 10% of the proceeds would go to the territorial university and the public schools, and 10% would go to the construction of a wagon road over Snoqualmie Pass. So let me run a lottery. You can have 20% of it, 20% of the, the profits, but I get everything else. And the legislature agreed to the terms. The exact word, reading of the law said, quote, be it enacted that any person residing in this territory who is desirous of aiding in the construction of a wagon road across the uh, the Cascade Mountains shall have the right to dispose of any property, real and personal, situate in this territory by lot or distribution under such restrictions and conditions as are provided in this act. But the law never mentioned the term lottery. That's, that's how they still do these things. Just super. That's how they give away like alleys to Amazon now. They you know. It's the way it's worded. It, it never trips across your radar until someone says, "Hey, they just gave Amazon a chunk of downtown." Like, mm-hmm. so. But yeah, no, we didn't. We allowed a provision for an annexation of a that will support schools and yeah. highways. Mm-hmm. Uh, but since it never it never said lottery, but Yesler immediately started printing advertisements for quote the first grand lottery of Washington Territory, and he would sell tickets for five dollars. Uh, he wanted to sell 60,000 tickets. The first prize was the mill, which he put at an inflated estimation of $100,000, uh, worth $100,000. Then some of his properties and other assets. Uh, there were over 5,000 prizes listed. There were only 3,500 people living in the county and about 500,000, li- or excuse me, 50,000 living in the territory. So the prospect of selling 60,000 tickets was absurd. Not going to happen. Other similar lotteries began popping up inspired by the new law, which thinned out the customer base, and anti-gambling activists began working against him. This guy, man. What a life he's seen. Yeah. He, he First, he's, you know, I mean, he still has, what, 600 acres, so you can't feel too bad for him. But, man, he's busting his ass, building a mill, mm-hmm. dr- you know, floating, the, dragging the boilers up on shore, and he still can't turn a profit. Can't turn a profit. And then all these other people weasel in. I mean, capitalism is just a brutal It's a system. rough game. It's, like, yeah. even for, like, a, a guy who you'd think would be massively successful. Well, he's a, he's a shrewd businessman, but he's also, he's kind of skeezy. He's really, <laughs> he's, he's, I mean, he's having affairs with teenage natives, and he's... yeah. You know, he's uh, trying to finagle his way into getting this lottery that they're saying you can do this, but don't call it a lottery. And he's saying, no, this is a lottery. So uh, and he might have been like a good a paragon of virtue for his time, for all we know. Uh, I don't know if he's a paragon of virtue, especially compared to the Denny's. The Denny's were were teetotaling Methodist prohibitionists mm-hmm. who didn't drink, smoke or swear. Uh, Maynard liked to drink, but, uh, the, the, the first settlers that came out here were basically trying to make a, a sober new city on the West Coast. And Yesler is saying, eh, I'm gonna build a mill and I'm gonna turn this into an industry town. Uh, other summer lotteries began popping up, and the lottery was supposed to be drawn July 4th, 1886, but he had it delayed to January of 1887. Anti-gambling activists filed a lawsuit, and a judge ruled the lottery was unconstitutional. Uh, he was charged a $25 fine in court costs. So they said you can do this thing, but you can't do a lottery, and he calls it a lottery, so it gets canceled. Uh, the King County Auditor demanded he relinquish all money raised to the public treasury, but he didn't comply. So Yesler gave away zero prizes, paid a $25 court fine, and walked away with $30,000. So and, and never gave away the property. Never gave away the property. He kept the property. He kept all the proceeds from the ticket he sold, which was $30,000. He paid a $25 court fee and walked away with it. This guy. Yeah. Brilliant way to make some money. Of course, he couldn't have foreseen I mean, any of that happening. Uh, 
this this is predicated on the idea that there's no like cops that are going to come to arrest him for tax evasion or, or whatnot. No, he's he's just he's fine. He's fine. He's he's Teflon out here. So that solves his financial problems. Got thirty thousand dollars from inadvertently causing a lottery scam. Uh, the Yesler's property rose in value as the city grew, and in 1883, they built a grand mansion on and a third sawmill. In 1885, Yesler was elected to a second one-year term as mayor. It would be his last foray into politics. Uh, Sarah died on August 28, 1887, at age 65. Her relatives contested Henry's claim over her estate, and a five-year legal battle began, with Henry eventually coming out on top. On June 6th, 1889, the Great Seattle Fire tore through downtown and destroyed most of Yesler's property. The sawmill burned down, uh, burned down, the sawmill burned down, but his manor was saved and later became the home of the Seattle Public Library. Until that was destroyed in a fire as well. A lot of fires. Uh, in the wake of the fire, he was able to bounce back and had many brick buildings built in Pioneer Square that still stand today. Old age was taking a toll on Henry. He was borrowing and lending money seemingly indiscriminately and would allow renters to go long stretches without payment, and he seemed to care little. He traveled back east and became close with his young cousin, Minnie Gaggle. The two married in 1890 when she was in her early 20s and Henry was in his late 70s. Two years later, Henry died on December 16, 1892. The estate was widely contested, but ended up going to Minnie. A friend said at his death, quote, Death came just as he was completing his object in life. His wealth he has never had a chance to enjoy, and he was taken up with his with business cares. This coming year, he had intended to settle back and enjoy life. He put off that pleasure too long. Work, 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 hustle, 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 and then dies before then he can enjoy any it. of it. With, uh, he had, like, he had... Young wives throughout his life. That's true. That, uh, young I'm wives sure and mistresses like offset the uh, yeah and, and free love and whatever else he got up to. Um, Probably so, some he, opium. He lived to his seventies. I mean, that's true. He did live in his seventies in the eighteen into in, in the eighteen nineties. Yeah, he had a huge, huge impact on this city. Huge He's like impact. a horny. There will be blood. Like if there will be blood <laughs> was part softcore porn. Yeah, like that's what he, that that would be his movie. Yeah, I was thinking like a horny Scrooge McDuck kind of guy. <laughs> this affluent kind of greedy kind of skeezy guy. So he would have like a a, a hot tub full of gold coins that he would bring his uh, yeah his, his his mistresses into yeah. But I mean, if it wasn't for a sawmill, the sawmill coming here. We wouldn't have Seattle today. It had such a huge impact. It brought in so many people, so much money, so many jobs, and really transformed transformed Seattle from a from a uh, this little colony with about twenty five people living on it into a major city. I, I think he earned his street name. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think he had a, an illustrious enough life to justify that street name. Yeah, two time mayor, seventh and fifteenth mayor. mayor. The lottery, the the free love, you know, mm-hmm. that's what you want in a in a nineteenth century uh, business mogul, businessman. Yeah, is, is you want a very illustrious. Uh, the teetotalers are pretty boring. Uh, you want a mm. you want a drunk, lusty guy. Yeah, and he definitely filled that spot. Yes. Well, thank you for listening to the Seattle Files. Thank you so much, for, Brett, for being here. Thanks for having me. I'll be back next Tuesday with a new topic and a new episode. Be sure to like us on Facebook, subscribe and rate in iTunes. Uh, if you have a topic suggestion you would like to hear an episode about, shoot me an email at theseattlefiles at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Be back next week. See you at Bumbershoot. See you at Bumbershoot. See you at Bumbershoot. See you at Bumbershoot. See you at Bumbershoot.